Without ever jumping, fluttering, or using flight pads, it is possible to collect almost everything in Bancho Tui. If you want to understand how this can be done, I'm here to walk you through it somewhat clumsily. If you prefer to be confused, you can find a link to the raw clips in the description. But before we go into the clips, let's speed through the rules. You know damn well what a jump is. To be clear, a jump requires an A-press, so moving around as the detonator is not jumping. For extra fun, we will also avoid using flight pads, Kazooie's feathery flap, and code chamber passwords. Now, for this video, I'm assuming you have a basic familiarity with Banjo-Tooie. Thus, we will focus only on things that would require jumps casually. All clips shown will be from an N64 emulator using tool assistance, but everything done here is possible in actual hardware if you have superhuman precision. And with that, let's jump right in to Mayhem Temple. Okay, I'm sorry about that. And um, speaking of I'm sorry, if I was actually a good video producer, I would script the rest of this video, but I am way too lazy to do that. So here I'm going to try to do this just off the cuff. Now, our first trip to Mayhem Temple, we're not getting a lot. We're going to get like five jiggies, a few moves, and the stuff we do get is really simple. So for this first clip, you can see easy jiggy grab. Now, I do want to call something out here because this is going to be re uh, relevant later. As you notice here, we're going to run off the edge, start a beak bust. That beak bust recoil will eventually grab us the jiggy. But note right here. You see how Banjo kind of jumped up? We did it again that frame. See, at the start of a beak bust, Banjo gets launched into the air a bit before coming crashing into the ground. Remember that because we're going to see that again shortly. And then to close out Mayhem Temple, again, only two clips, you can kick that Jinjo instead of jumping to it. But now comes the first major boss of this challenge, which is this ledge right here. Those who have tried Jumpless in the past have realized very quickly that you cannot jump to the... Without being able to jump to the grip grab crack on the left, there is no way up this high ledge. Or so they thought. Okay, that's going to require some explanation. And this might be the most in-depth explanation of the video, so bear with me. Let me move back a bit. And let's see in slow motion what happened at the end here. So, of course, the enemy drops a skill stop honeycomb. We run over here. Beak bust. And once again, we're going to get the height boost at the start of the beak bust. But as we get that height boost, we grab that skill stop honeycomb. This is going to cancel our beak bust state, which means we're just left with this launch upwards and we skip the crashing into the ground part. Thus sending us just high enough to get onto this ledge with normal gravity. Now... The one thing you may be asking, or you probably aren't asking because you don't think about this stuff as much as I do, but is how did we even start a beak bust in the first place? We're on flat ground. And this is a trick that is going to come up a lot. It's called a bit clip, and it's kind of crazy. In short, if I, if I show in slow motion, yeah, not that slow, but whatever. As you can see, we're floor level, but we actually started falling through the floor in order to get this to happen. So the floors in this game are made of textured triangles. Thanks to floating point rounding error, it is possible to be between two of these triangles such that the game fails to detect you're either on one or the other. And if you can't detect which triangle you're on, you're essentially not over anything. You're over nothingness, and so you fall. The regions where this work is are absurdly small. In most situations, you're more likely to win the lottery than unintentionally fall through the floor. But what does that help here? Well, it gives us a falling state. And when you're in a falling state, you can do a beak bust. So I don't, I don't recall if I mentioned, but that's called a big clip, and we'll be seeing them a lot throughout the run. They end up being very useful, even if they're just for falling through the floor. So moving on to plateau, before we go into Glitter Gulch Mine, we can actually grab this Jinjo. Now, 
that's a bit weird because we don't have the build drill. And if you recall, that is a boulder that is normally broken with build drill. But we can actually shoot an egg and then beak barge. This extends the hitbox enough that we can grab items within either rocks like that or behind glass walls, etc. So that's another useful trick called a hitbox extension. Getting into the level, it's pretty easy, peck and pound. Glitter Gulch Mine, we'll do a bit more than we did in Mayhem Temple, but still, we're not going to do a lot in this first visit. In fact, we're going to start out by activating the cutscene to open the room to the Waterfall Cavern. I think that's the name. But we can't jump across the uh, water right there, so we need to go around in order to cross it. And we still have more than enough time to get to where we need to go, which is not actually the Waterfall Cavern. That was a bait. We're going to run off this edge in our running shoes, Gives us a lot of distance. As soon as the falling too far animation starts, we cancel into a peck. This maintains our momentum. It gives us extra speed as we go all the way here. And then we can beak bust to get that little bit of height to land on this side. So one more time. Awesome, we're here, now what? Now we wait. Because as soon as this cutscene ends, or as soon as that timer ends, a cutscene starts. And as we just saw, a cutscene can cancel your beak bust and give you that upwards launch. And so using that, we were able to let learn build drill. We could also go to Mumbo with some pretty easy grenade shots. And now that we have build drill, we can climb these much larger ledges by doing the same kind of beak bust trick as we did before. Mumbo, not much to see there. None of his stuff really requires jumps even casually. So let's instead shift over to the detonator, which is a bit more interesting. First of all, you can blow up these rocks, which is useful. Then you don't have to worry about kind of getting on top of them to build your room. But secondly, and more importantly, is this room, the fuel depot. Now, as you can see, when you walk as the detonator, you do these little hops, which as we already have confirmed earlier, they are hops and not jumps. They do not use an A-press but they do give you positive vertical momentum, and that's really useful here. If we bit clip, we hop, while underneath the level, and then hit the water plane. Now, in the early releases of the game, or basically anything besides just the US version, if you jump into the, a water plane, or sorry, if you just touch a water plane at all with the detonator and explode at the same time, you maintain your momentum. So we maintain the momentum of that jump, and float in the air. This lets, us, uh, this lets us get to the top and blow up the TNT. So that's prepped, which is great. We can just do a few more jumps and explosions to get these remaining notes. And as you'll, as always in this run, if you're ever stuck somewhere, the best way to get out is to die. Getting into Chuffy, which was raised with Mumbo, is another thing that could be sort of tricky. As you can see, there's a ladder, but it's high above the ground. But if you just run at it with the right angle, you can actually get up. It's weird. Inside, you just do a damage boost. Nothing too crazy. And after beating Old King Cole, that's enough for uh, Glitter Gulch Mine for now. Again, we'll come back to it. On to Witchy World, where we can get some notes by pecking through the wall here. We can also get the Cactus of Strength Jiggy by using a series of damage boosts. Now, the difficult thing with this is health management. We only have so much health, and we had to use three health bars to get up here. So as we jump off the top here, I peck, and then build drill. The peck resets your falling damage so that you don't just take damage as soon as you land. Running off the switch lets you grab onto the pole. And one more peak bust is enough to spawn the jiggy. And as much as I hate to talk during one of the best songs in the game, it is Mr. Patch time. Now, some people think you need to fly for Mr. Patch. That is not the case. We'll demonstrate here.
And that's that. Pretty simple. Just be really, really good. So to get the Jinjo on the top of the Dodgem's Dome, we'll need to do a few damage boosts, nothing crazy. But up here, we show the first instance of what's a generally useful trick, which is getting onto poles where you can't um, kind of run off the switch like you could for the Cactus of Strength. And that's if you turn away from the pole while in Talon Trot and shoot a grenade downwards, Banjo will grab the pole. And so that's just a generally useful trick. You'll be seeing this again and again. But up here, we're going to do something even crazier. And we're not going to fully understand it yet. But if we look over here, blow up the switch for the Saucer of Peril, and grab the Jinjo at the same time, we'll start the Saucer of Peril freeing cutscene, but it will be interrupted by the Jinjo cutscene. We're going to come back to this a lot later, why this matters. But the key thing is that that happened. So onto Isle of Hags, we can do a bit of cleanup here. Get some notes. These notes are helpful. Because these notes will allow us to get a very useful move, which is Clockworks. That right there was a bit clip, which lets us go through the Talon Torpedo Boulder in Pine Grove without having learned Talon Torpedo. Don't worry, we will learn the move, but now just wasn't the right time. And once we're through here, we can get Clockworks. And Clockworks are broken. And I mean really, really broken. Here you can see how we can use them to get a Jinjo and some notes, but that's pretty basic. We can use them to get this Treble Clef. There is a clock for this. There's a clock for these notes. I think you understand where this run might be heading. Don't worry, it's not everything, but clocks are very useful. You can even use them to get to stop the swap items. So here I already blew up the uh, cartridge with another clockwork. And then I show you can just grab the ice cube with your clockwork. And now that we have this powerful move, it's on to Mayhem Temple to get a lot of the remaining stuff. With, you guessed it, clockwork shots. Again, nothing here should be that surprising. Things are high up in the air. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of help to grab them. In some locations, you can even do two clockwork shots from the same spot and get two unique things. Did I mention Clockworks were broken? This is actually a very hard shot to find, and I believe people who've tried no jumps in the past were unable to locate that shot. That's a tricky one. The angle there is very difficult. Now this is something that's a bit interesting. I'm going to walk around, and it's with a specific timing, but it's not going to make any sense. Okay, I walked around. Now what? Well, now we can actually go through the swamp. See, every 20 seconds or so, an enemy called a Dragunda jumps out of the swamp and laughs at you. If you move out of that enemy's spawn range while it's doing that laughing animation, its animation will get stuck, and the swamp basically becomes perfectly walkable. So by doing that little weird dance over in the other area of Prison Compound, I was able to stop this Dragunda from spawning and get close enough for yet another Clockwork Shot. And of course, damage boosts are good for when we do have to build drill boulders. And that's most of everything in Mayhem Temple. Uh, the rest is all done very easily, casually, without jumping, with the exception of one or two things we'll touch on later on. Now, for the next part, we go back to Glitter Gulch Mine, where we resume our regularly scheduled block. This one's unique, though. That somehow teleported Banjo, not just the clockwork. And so this is called a teleportation special glitch. The way it's done is by taking damage while a clockwork is right next to any kind of grabbable pole, ladder, basically anything you can grab without the grip grab move. The effect is to warp Banjo up, assuming you're in the line of sight, warp him up to that climbable object which in this case obviously is very good because there's a Cheeto page inside this water container that you cannot hit with a clockwork directly. 
But while we're here, we can just do a normal clockwork shot too. And finally, because the Mega Globo is in this area, I show it here, where a clockwork shot at the ceiling can drop down and give a damage boost to reach this higher edge. And that's it. On to Pterodactyl Land. We'll, you may have noticed we skipped a level. Don't worry, we'll come back to it. We have enough jiggies. So this first little ledge I paused right in front of, this is a ledge that multiple characters have to get past, and the best way to do it is with a dinosaur. Inside this Dyracosaurus cave, we can also build really this, because we're going to become Mumbo very soon. But first is one of the crazier glitches in the run. Or strategies, I should say. We started off with the big clip. The pause generates a bit of extra lag to make it easier. And then we come over to the side and out of bounds water and shoot the switch. During that cutscene of the, of the, um, sorry, right before that cutscene, I actually moved outside of the water and then came back into it. This activates a glitch called first person mode, where you can actually move around with your cursor out. From there, we move off the water plane and shoot a clockwork. Now, when you're on a water plane, the game is constantly trying to push you up. When you leave the water plane, that changes, of course. However, the clockwork puts you in what's called a locked state. And that means certain changes that would normally happen to Banjo as he moves from one status to another won't happen. So, by leaving the water plane as soon as that blew up we keep the lock state of floating but there's no longer a water plane above us of which to float to what does that do well after waiting a bit watching this dinosaur spin around for absolutely no reason we're up here that entire time while the clockwork was out banjo was just floating and floating and floating and there was no water plane to stop him with a peck, we're up here, and we can run around. And so this lets us get to the top of Pterodactyl Land. Useful for a lot of different things, especially with that warp pad. But we're not done yet. We're going to run to this area. And we're going to shoot a clockwork and beak barge at the same time. What this does is, once again, locks our movement state. But in this case, we're locked to a beak barge state. Now, a beak barge moves way faster than normal movement. And so by locking us into that state, we can essentially rocket ourselves off this edge here. Such that we get enough distance where we can reach this boulder. And inside this boulder is a Cheeto page we could otherwise not get without jumping. Because this crack that you're on, I'm on right now is way too high. But once we're over there, we can become Mumbo, come back, use the dinosaur boost we saw earlier, and ascend this slope. Now... The way slopes work in this game is once you're on the slope, you have a certain amount of time before you start slipping down. If you get off the slope, for example, by passing over flat ground, that timer is reset. So here, I walk on the edge of the platform. As you can see right here, my shadow disappeared. I'm now over the much lower ground. That resets the slope timer. I then re-land back on the platform and repeat. So here, once again, start at fall, re-land. And this lets us get up a slippery slope without slipping. Once inside, Mumbo can enlarge this Duracosaurus. But also, because I was moving faster, with Solo Kazooie, there's a trick where if you are crouching, you do not take fall damage. And so using that, we can get to a lot of different places in the level because we already got to the top. We can fall down to most places we need to fall down to. In this case, the Hatch Cave. Inside the hatch cave, there's this nice damage boost, but watch carefully as the dinosaur actually does a lot of work here, not only giving me damage, but his hitbox pushing me up further and allowing me to get onto this ledge to learn hatch. Now that we have hatch, well, we can get this one jiggy, and that probably deserves an explanation what happened there. This is the jiggy that you normally get with the Tyrannosaurus by roaring at the cage. But what we actually did here is shoot through a very narrow seam there. Not like bit clip narrow, not even on the same scale, but a narrow seam where 
you can actually shoot a clockwork right through. And so that skips that entire section. And we're off to Jolly Rogers Lagoon now that we have Hatch. Here we just first start collecting stuff around town. That's a lot of doubloons. That means getting to these split up pads in the center, which may take a few damage boosts. We can grab those doubloons in the ground with a grenade and with a wing whack. We can use more damage boosts to hatch the egg. And even to get up some boxes inside Pono's, where we get some fun platforming. And same thing in Blubbers. And you know what time it is. It is clockwork time. And also a cut to the next part of the video time. But this clockwork shot, this one is way different. See, this is another one of the big barriers that people who've tried in real time in the past have been unable to get past. And even people who try with TS, G TAS, sorry, generally wouldn't know what to do here. So let's watch this one in slow motion. We'll see it in fast motion afterwards. The clockwork shot falls, and it's about to explode. But if you'll notice, that splash is way below Banjo. And it's even more clear after the explosion, we already are very high in the air. Now, this allows us to get on the ledge behind. I'll, I'll just show that part. That is very difficult to do, to land on that ledge there, but it is just barely possible. But how are we floating in the first place? Well, the same glitch as we saw in Pterodactyl Land. If you are not over water and you enter a clockwork mode, you start floating. But um, we were over water. So what gives? Well, this is where things get pretty crazy because that was a bit clip of the water. Just like the land, water is made of triangles. And just like the land, it's possible to be between two triangles and not be over either due to floating point error. Now, the water in here sways back and forth. So every frame while you're in C-Up, you're actually moving positions. Except when the clockwork explodes, your position is locked. So even though you're in this bit clip spot for only a single frame before water moves you back, you can start floating. And because you, we take damage, right as this state ends, we get to maintain the height that we gained. So one more time in full speed. Float up, blow up, Talon Torpedo is ours. And then back to the shots. Or just some fun platforming. Of course, this room could also be do done with clockwork shots, but Come on, this is more interesting. And that's just about everything in Jolly Rogers Lagoon. So let's go dip into here. I mean, sorry, we're missing the pig pool jiggy, but that comes later through Cloud Cuckoo Land anyway. So let's just take a little detour to hit the switch in Frontier Industries while we're here. After, of course, another clock of shot. Except, we're not going to do that. We're going to fall through the ground here. Well, we will do that. We'll, we'll hit the switch. But we're also going to swim under the ground here. And through this, we can access the main area of Grunty Industries, despite the fact that the level isn't even opened yet. So, this acid will burn you back up to the platform we just passed under. We can use an egg barge, or a hitbox extension, to grab that jiggy. Use another trick with Talon Torpedo to cancel the damage from the acid. And swim just enough so that Banjo's nose can touch this jiggy. When we want to exit this room, there is conveniently a ladder on this side. We can't actually cross this acid pit, but we can just leave to the main part of the level through this exit. Where we can do more clockwork shots. Or skip those using a tin top to damage boost the notes. Finally, we can get the Weldar Jiggy very early, just to boost our Jiggy count, by doing another precise shot through a seam. And 
And with that, we're on to Hailfire Peaks. So Hailfire Peaks is a level with a lot of platforming. Luckily, at the bottom level, you have lava to help boost you up. So we can skip all the platforms that you normally spawn to get this Jinjo and just damage boost up to it. We can also get the Jiggy that you normally have to split up many times to get, but this is a bit of a different clockwork shot. I'm going to play this one in slow motion just so you can see what's happening here. We go into first person mode, but as we go into first person mode, notice this fireball landing behind me. As it lands, it's going to start to shake the screen. And as the screen shakes, your, the camera moves through the wall during the shaking animation or motion. Because of this, we can actually fire a clockwork shot when the camera is through the wall. So even though we're not like clipping through any seam or anything, we can shoot a clockwork through the wall and grab that chicken. Awesome. Now for some more platforming. These uh, steps on the right, they're our best way up, but reaching that first step is just too far from down here. So we'll ascend. And we'll do the ladder trick again, and we'll keep ascending. And once again, we can do a beak barge for speed, then peck, and build drill to get up those little slopes, we, or little uh, platforms we saw. Our reward at the top is a clockwork shot for honeycomb. Claps for that. Oh, and another clockwork shot for honeycomb. Claps for that too. Then comes the volcano. This volcano is a has a lot of platforming in it. Luckily, there's a lava floor to help us out, but we don't want to abuse it too much. We only have so much health. So that's one place to use it. But overall, this is a, I wouldn't say simple platforming, but it's platforming using more basic moves, things like pecs and, and beak busts. By the way, I've been calling it Beak Bust. I know it's technically called Beak Buster, but I'm not saying that extra syllable every time. No one does. So apologies for anyone out there who's really offended by that. I completely understand the uh, desire to be technical about move names, but sorry, can't be me. And that's the Volcano Jiggy. On to Icy Side. We start with Solo Kazooie with another Clockwork Shot through a wall. Or sorry, not through a wall, but through a, a, a seam in the wall. And then we Wing Whack. And if you Wing Whack and do it where we properly touch the slope and then leave the slope and then touch the slope again. I said that slightly wrong, but you get the gist of the idea. You actually can reset the slope timer. And so we can keep doing that to Wing Whack over here where our good friend Chili Willy is to get us all the way up to learn glide. And also do the ice school grotto from reverse. As you can see, glide, very powerful move. As you can see, clockwork shot, very powerful move. Especially when there's these little gaps and collision everywhere that we can shoot clockworks through. But Chili Willy is so nice in this level. Here we show how Mumbo can get to Saberman. Uh, Banjo also can get up in a similar way to feed Boggy. And he, once Mumbo is done, we need to start freeing the aliens. So this first one I included, not because it's that interesting, you just walk off an edge and build drill the alien, but it actually shows a new glitch I found while working on this, so I thought it was worth documenting, where if you take fall damage right as you build drill, oops, then you skip the cutscene of the drill completely. So let me just show that one more time, just because that's new. No drilling. From there, Chili Willy gives you enough of a damage boost to drill the other alien. And the third alien can be gotten very easily with Glide. One more clockwork shot through a seam gets us this Jiggy. And a few more Chili boosts lets us get to the Oil Drill Jiggy with Solo Banjo. And when we're finally done with all that, we can go back to Mayhem Temple. And the entrance to Mayhem Temple from Hailfire Peaks is special. 
because it puts us in the Kickball Coliseum. From here, we can activate the warp, warp to Humba, transform to Stony, and then warp back. What this allows us to do is to skip the large steps in front of the Kickball Stadium, which Sony could not get over. However, inside the Kickball Stadiums, the steps are a lot smaller. So we can do some kind of difficult, but not that bad, I don't know what's called, barge attacks to get up to the top. And on to Cloud Cuckoo Land. Now, I want to say something before we get into Cloud Cuckoo Land in any more detail. There is a bee in this level that you can transform into, and the bee is very broken. The bee is also not a flight pad, meaning technically we can fly with it without breaking any of our rules. It feels like a weird edge case though, so I'm going to only use the bee for one jiggy where it's absolutely required, which is the eyeball plant jiggy. Other than that, we're going to try using the, the bee completely. So we'll start with this, which skips using springy step shoes to jump over that bar. Apparently, if you shoot a clockwork shot and it lands right on the bar and then walk over it, the nitwit Mr. Fit thinks that you just jumped over the bar. Now, I don't know what he's looking at. Maybe he's too fixated on that timepiece he has. But obviously, that's not jumping over the bar. But who cares? There, we show another bit clip to build drill that rock. Easy enough. Kind of the same thing as we saw at the start of the run. And onto clocks. But because the central cavern is a bit mazy and has a bit of a confusing layout, I included a few clips of how to navigate it without jumping. You can see there's places you can fall to other places. This gets you to the center, including Super Stash, which once again has a gap you can just shoot through. And allows you to get to the Red Skull, where Mumbo can slide down this mountain and reach his rain dance pad in order to spawn the rainbow. Solo Kazooie makes good use of the Clock Clamor Boots that we learned in Grunty Industries to be able to move around this area. Here we see that if you use the hatch move while falling into water, you can actually fall right through it, which is awesome because it lets us get that Globo and damage boost out. And now we get to see a few clips of how broken Glide is. As you can see, with Glide, you can go pretty much wherever you want in this level. I mean, there's, there's obvious exceptions, but this lets us open up the pot of gold. Once inside, you have to drop down, shoot some eggs into some slots, and then you need to get back up onto the platform you started on. You can't do that without jumping. So what instead you have to do is do this entire process twice, where you open up the pot of gold, go inside, activate the mini game, leave, repeat, and then you can finally do the mini game and get the jiggy. Also, we can glide to the honeycomb. Sped up a bit, because at this point you understand what gliding looks like. And once inside the trash can, we can get the Jinjo on the Snacky Fatty Chucks. Now, this one bears slow motion because this is a trick we're going to be using a lot. When you're moving with Sack Pack, like the Detonator, you do little hops. These are not jumps. These are hops. They do not use an A-press. But if you do a hop and then let go of Z so that you cancel your Sack Pack, you get an extra height boost. And so that gives you a, the effective height of a double jump without ever pressing A or jumping at all. Awesome. That can also be used to grab jiggies like the one there and the one in the cheese wedge. But how do we get the cheese wedge? Well, this crazy shenanigan. Just as before, if you go into the water as sack pack and stop moving, you're in a floating state. If your momentum carries you off the water plane in that sack floating state, you keep floating because there's no water plane to stop you, and you get the same thing as we saw with the clockwork method with Banjo and Kazooie. If you do it with a very proper timing, you actually can move around during this. Normally you can't, but here we can. So this just lets us ascend to the skies. Beautiful. Hi, Mr. Fit. And the reason that's important is because we can't get to Mr. Fit any other way. If we try to climb the beanstalk that you would normally take, it just doesn't work because Banjo can't leave the beanstalk without jumping. You can climb to the top and then you're stuck there. So obviously that helps get to Mr. Fit. 
that also helps to get to the cheese wedge, where once again, you normally have to climb a beanstalk, but we can't do that. Now, this is slow, so I will speed it up here a bit, but you get the sense of what it's like moving around with a levitating stack pack. The cool thing about this is once we cancel our stack pack and fall, we don't take fall damage. Inside the cheese, easy jump. Not jump, sorry. I, before anyone goes crazy about that, easy hop by holding forward with the control stick. Getting ahead of that. And then onto Solo Kazooie, who has a little trick of her own. See, when she normally is floating on water, she doesn't have that special floating property that we need to, in order to do levitation. But when she tries to dive by pressing B and does this little fake diving animation, it does work. And after each of these diving animations, you have one frame to link it to another diving animation to maintain your height and not start falling. So by chaining these dives together, we once again start levitating. And if I didn't mention earlier, the reason why we're not over water anymore is because we bit clipped to the very edge of the water, which lets us move past the edge of it. Once we're at the top, we have some vertical momentum and then we can glide off of it. Where we're going to drop into another bit clip. This one's a bit tricky to do, well, very tricky to do. But we fall into a bit clip, try to wing whack to keep ourselves from falling too far, spam a few glides to modulate our height, and enter the hive game without the bee. Inside, while well, we don't need any flying around shooting uh, stingers, we can just do this. And I'm not going to show the whole mini game here, but you can see in 14 seconds, I already got 18. It's very easy to get the target number. Now that is the B. Again, I mentioned I don't really like having to use the B here, but luckily with the B, if you walk off an edge and press A, you can fly. And that lets you fly without jumping. So if you don't like the B, feel free to not count this jiggy, but technically it doesn't break any rules, so I will count it. This lets you get the eyeball plants. And onto Pterodactyl Land. Once again, we can do one of these beak barge peck maneuvers to reach the springy step shoes without fluttering. We can also do clockwork shots, as I know you love. In this case, in order to avoid having to jump around with the clockwork, we can get this one Rocknut tribe member from up above. As you can see, he's looking off in a weird direction, so we can actually get behind him just enough to activate him without hitting his shield in the front. And then the bonfire cavern here is pretty self-explanatory. Just fun, jumpless platforming. Stomponadon, we don't have to worry about going in those little holes because we have Wonder Ring. And on the other side, we only need to get one, uh, we only need to get the pair over because with the hitbox extension, we can grab that Jinjo. As solo Banjo, we can again use the sack pack to our advantage to help us get the taxi pack, which is otherwise too high to reach. Thanks to a little damage boost. We can also burn off this fire to get across the uh, brambles, but that fire also has a separate effect. When you get burned by fire, you actually have lower gravity until the next action that resets your gravity. What that means is that our sack packs have become way floatier, as you can see here. So, one, that sack pack helps us get on that edge, great. But two, what do we do now that we have the totem? Well, we save and quit. When we return to Mayhem Temple later, we will have the totem. We don't actually need to leave the room with it. So that's a nice little trick there. Of course, gliding is powerful, and Kazooie's Wing Whack can grab that treble clef. You can also do another clockwork shot through a small gap in order to get that Jinjo and skip the Daddy T-Rex. But here is one other kind of brand new glitch, not, sorry, brand new, but something we haven't talked about yet, which is a clockwork 
warp. Clockwork warp. Clock warp. That's a hard thing to say. Clockwork warp. So if we shoot a clockwork, we can go through a loading zone. Standard of stuff. If we blow up that clockwork as we go through the loading zone, well, when we blow up the clockwork, we gain re we as we blow up the clockwork, we regain control with Banjo. And therefore, Banjo is the one who comes out on the other side. So here, shoot a clockwork. It gets blown up. And we were able to skip the Daddy T-Rex. You can't get over there anyway without jumping. This lets us get to the Oogle Boogle Cave. Now, we can't get either of the Jiggies in here, at least not yet. But it does give us a way to open the passage into Witchy World. So we're done with TDL for now. We will be back. But on to Witchy. Which, we never actually got all the clockwork stuff here yet, so let's do a bit of that. This shot is actually very tricky. I mean, if you notice how that landed, this is not an easy shot to hit or to find. But luckily it works. This shot's easier. And it allows us to activate a warp pad to reach Wumba's wigwam. Meanwhile, in the desert area, you can use Solo Banjo's Sack Pack to learn Pack Whack, as well as to get into the pump room. Solo Kazooie can join with a nice glide off the top of the deflated castle. And then, once inside the castle, she can do Hoop Hurry just fine. It, I wouldn't say just fine. It is tricky, but it's, it's definitely doable. Now, one other caveat I want to mention is the other minigame in the castle, which is the Balloon Burst Challenge. This challenge puts you in flight automatically. Not a flight pad, you're put in flight automatically. However, you don't ever have to press A at all. You can just fall to the ground, shooting all the balloons, and complete it just fine. I am not counting that since it doesn't break any rules. You're not even pressing A once. If you disagree, feel free to knock another jiggy off the total. Once you get these jiggies, though, it's another clockwork. This Jinjo on your right here is a bit high, but a wing whack can clip it just enough to grab it. And we can then glide to activate the burger switch. Inside this area, inside the star spinner area, once Mumbo activates the star spinner, a very difficult glide into damage boost can let us reach the star. Just barely. Where we can get a clockwork shot on the spinning star. Now, this is the room where the train switch is for Witchy World. We need the train in order to get the Styracosaurus kid back to Pterodactyl Land. But the train switch is very high up, and normally you would have to jump up to a grip grab crack to reach it. To get around that, we're going to use a series of wing wax and glides on the weird geometry in this area, including this, where we're going to spam glide repeatedly. Here I'm dropping and reactivating glide against a slope surface to gain little bits of height. Now that doesn't work everywhere, or even in most places, but right there it works, and, th and I'm thankful for that. But that's basically everything to do in Witchy World, so on to Grunt Industries. With uh, Solo Banjo, we can open the Trash Compactor. No, sorry, not Trash Compactor. We can open up the Toxic Waste area from down below, which is great because it's hard for Solo Banjo to get up that ledge. Once it's open, you see that pipe on the right. You can drop down to it after using the Claw Clamor Boots to get Banjo and Kazooie into the Waste Disposal Plant. Once in there, you can then split up again to have Solo Banjo inside, where you can do this. This allows you to get, it's called Snooze Pack, but really it should be called Slack Pack. Everything else rhymes. Why couldn't they rhyme there? 
Anyways, back outside, another bit clip into a hatch drops us deep into the water. And we're in water, we're approaching out of bounds. I think you know by now where this is going. Time for some levitation. And of course, this levitation can be stopped at any point by stopping your dives. So you could grab that treble, you could glide over to that window to get the Cheeto page. In this case, we're just gonna go to the top, glide over here and get the honeycomb. And from there, show how some of the movement in this level works, because it's not that obvious. There, we entered the smokestack from the top to get to floor three, which lets us open this passageway and to get to the box room from the top. Now, this is, room is normally a crazy amount of platforming, but from the top and with some clockwork shots, we can actually make a lot easier work of it. And on to floor two, where we can claw clamber up the wall and glide to get some of these harder to reach notes. When in floor four, which we can reach from the outside, there are some crushers and we cannot shut them off. And they block the way to the back part of the level where there's quite a few interesting things such as uh, the Clanker's Cavern minigame, or sorry, Clinker's Cavern minigame. To get around that, we're going to go through quality control, but we need to go through the back. So this is another clockwork warp, set it right that time, to get into the quality control. From here, after getting the jiggy, which is easy enough, we can bit clip. This lets us get to the bottom area where we will ascend these boxes with the help of our good friend, the Minjo. Watch carefully as he pushes us up even further and lets us ascend that box. And then we need to go to the wire room in reverse, but this is just a few damage boosts We're running against sloped surfaces. And after that, the door is not solid on this side, so we can just walk right out and be in the upper floor four. From here, if we enter the elevator shaft with solo banjo, we can drop down the floor three for the Twinkly's minigame. This is not an easy drop though. It's very easy to die trying to do this. So the way to do it is get into sack pack, cancel it, use your pack whack, and make sure you land during your pack whack animation. If you land before or after your pack whack animation, you will die. So, cool little trick there. But on to the final cleanup, and this is where things get even crazier. So, remember, however many years ago, when we were talking about canceling the Saucer of Peril cutscene, it's going to come into play again. We're going to reactivate that cutscene that we were in the middle of, only we're going to reactivate it with the bit of an interesting situation set up. First, we're getting the Chomposaurus Jiggy. Once again, bit clip, clockwork, going out of bounds while floating, and that's gonna let us levitate to the top. Here we go, we do the Chomposaurus minigame, and we're fine. Immediately after doing that mini game, we need to save and quit and come to Glitter Gulch Mine, where some easy enough platforming gets us to the split up pads. If we take Solo Kazooie, this is the entrance to Fuel Depot. If we take Solo Kazooie over to this entrance and shoot a clockwork in, we're about to do a one of the weirder glitches you'll see in this game. So as we enter the Fuel Depot, the cutscene reactivates. The cutscene that we had interrupted earlier for the Saucer of Peril starts up again. But instead of after this part of the cutscene playing, moving us back to Witchy World, it will instead move us back to the place of the last cutscene we watched. 
which in this case was inside Chompa's belly. So now we're in our clockwork, but we just got warped back here and we're suddenly in Regal Blaster mode. The game is not ready for this. The game is not ready for us to suddenly be in Briegel Blaster mode, as we can see when we exit. We're like normal. I have no clockwork here. But something is amiss. And we'll see it very quickly. Oh, I have all of Solo Banjo's moves. But not only that, I am treated as Banjo and Kazooie, so I can leave levels unlike Solo Banjo. This gives us the ability to take Solo Banjo, or not Solo Banjo, it's Banjo and Kazooie, but with Solo Banjo moves anywhere. Now, the important thing to remember here is this is still Banjo and Kazooie, meaning it can go through lo special loading zones, and, well, you'll see what happens in this clip. We grab the Flotus. I think that's what they're called. Flotus Flotium. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Anyways, we grab the Flotus over here, drop it, and taxi pack it at the same time that we touch the springy step shoes. As you noticed, we now have a giant Kazooie. I mentioned she was still with us. The reason she's giant is because your backpack is big because you're holding a Flotus. In fact, we're still holding that Flotus no matter where we go. So let's just drop it here in Clifftop. This allows us to put it back in the backpack and levitate to this train station switch we otherwise could not reach. This will allow us to heal the sick Styracosaurus kid. But there's more we can do with this state. Back in Grunty Industries, we can big clip with the sack pack and do the sack pack levitation glitch to reach the Weldar area. Now, this couldn't be done with just solo Banjo because that loading zone only works if you're both Banjo and Kazooie. That's what this quote, that's what this so called hybrid Banjo lets us do. We don't even need to fight Weldar. Recall we got his jig earlier and we could just hop across with the sack pack. If we return to Witchy World, we can use the extended hitbox of Pack Whack to grab these Claw Clamor boots and head back up to the Oogle Boogle cave we opened earlier. Here, we can once again grab, a, grab our Flotus and begin floating. Now, floating with this is kind of weird it, there seems to be some kind of direction that's preferred that you move faster in, so that's why I'm moving with kind of weird angle. But we can float all the way over here. And as this Flotus comes out of our bag, it's going to push us up just high enough for us to grab this ledge. No, that's cool. But here's the other thing is Kazooie's still with us. So we can still shoot eggs, even though we are effectively solo banjo in moves. However, this only works in first person mode. Not a big loss, first person mode is usually great, but we're about to see where that becomes a major issue. Back to the lava side of Hailfire Peaks, we can sack pack levitate. This allows us to skip the flight pad and reach Chili Billy. Now, this loading zone, like the Weldar loading zone, only works with Banjo and Kazooie, which is why we needed hybrid mode to do this. Once inside, we're on a ring on top of the volcano. The special thing about this ring is you can't go into first person mode. So we have eggs, but we can't shoot them and we need to shoot them to hurt the, the boss. What's the solution here? Well, only on this ring can we not use eggs. If we fall to the starting platform, you can actually still shoot eggs. Not that there's any way you could possibly have an angle that would hit the cannon from down here. There's a big wall in your way. 
until you remember a trick we talked about earlier, where the meteor allows us to shoot through the wall. That gives us the very necessary angle we need in order to get that hit in. Unfortunately, this only works for three hits. After those three hits, that first cannon disappears, and we're out of luck, because nothing else is close to the starting platform. Until you realize that this little edge of the waterfall, lava fall, excuse me, is not actual lava. It's a, it's a slippery slope. So we can fall onto it and get into first person mode. In first, in per first person mode, you do not slide, even if the slope timer hits, hits the uh, end result. Once again, we wait for fireball and shoot that ice egg through the wall to hit that cannon. But we're stuck. We're down here. If we ever leave C up mode, we'll immediately start sliding. So what can we do? We can damage ourselves. Well, it gives us a bit of height, not too helpful. If we land on the slope again, we'll start sliding. But watch my shadow. Oh, it disappeared. That was another bit clip. Because we are, if we're not over either of the floor triangles directly, like that seem to be directly below us, we're over nothing. And if we're over nothing, we're not over a slope. And if we're not over a slope, our slope timer resets. So we can run again, just enough to, before we start slipping, see up again, get ready to time our shot, dodge the tongue phase, blow ourselves up, and use the lava to boost us back to land. Where we have to do the whole process again. Now, if you're wondering why we need to do that whole thing and we couldn't have just stayed down there, it's because the dragon stops shooting meteors at you at some point when you're down there. So we need to reset this whole process in order to do it again. But here's the other problem, we're at one health. We obviously can't do that whole set of, that took four damage to do that whole thing. We can't do it again. Hey, snack, uh, sorry, slack pack is a useful move for once. And that ends our hybrid section. When we're done with the hybrid, we can return to Fuel Depot and, and do the Saucer of Peril that we skipped before. While we're up here, we have one last clockwork shot. And that's it. That is everything in the game that was listed earlier, except for three jiggies. Now, of course, you didn't see clips of everything. Some of the stuff, for instance, Target Zan's Temple, doesn't require jumping. So I didn't feel like it was necessary to, to show that. You'll also notice the 22 in the corner right there. That's just because this clip was done slightly out of order. But at this point, we have all 25 honeycombs, all 25 Cheeto pages, all 900 notes, all 17 globos plus the mega globo, all 24 moves from jam chars, really everything you could want except for three jiggies. So... The natural question is what's missing. Well, to get to the Hailfire Peaks Coliseum for kickball, you need to get up that ledge on the left, and there's no way to do that. Luckily, with one jump, you can burn yourself there, but that's a jump. In the Oogle Boogle Cave, there is this very high egg. I don't know how Kazooie's getting up there, do you? Chances are there is no way up, but... Maybe we'll find one one day. And finally, with the washing machine, you can't do that. That minuscule gap needs a jump to get over. Same with this ledge that barely gets even half your height. So that's two jumps for the washing machine. So in total, those three jiggies take four jumps. Not a lot. But there's one thing missing that you may be thinking about. And that's the final boss. See, I've been focusing on collectibles this whole time, not about beating the game. In fact, the final boss takes two jumps as well, because while you can run over this first wire, the second wire is just too tall for the clockwork. But if you blow yourself up as you enter the battery chamber, frame perfect, you can clockwork warp and gain control of Banjo inside the battery chamber. Well, great. Banjo has first-person mode. He can blow up the batteries. We're good, right? Uh, kinda? We can blow up a battery. We could actually blow up both batteries if we came in a second time, but, uh... Now what? Normally, when you blow up a battery, you 
resume the fight, but we're just stuck here. And if we leave, the fight restarts. And other than that, the only way to leave is to die. So that's that. That is almost everything in Banjo-Tooie without jumping, without using a flight pad, and without using Feathery Flap. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for all the people who work and try to break this game. I, I specifically need to call out, of course, Xcord, Chronikeys, Captain Cole, probably others I'm forgetting that have found some of the tricks in this run, as well as a bunch of tricks I found myself. And thank you, everyone, for sitting through the least professional commentary you'll probably hear in a while. So thank you. And I've said thank you too many times, so that's my cue to click stop recording.